It's uh, about time for us to start, maybe a minute early, but that's okay. Welcome everybody here this morning for our Bible class hour. Um, I don't have any sick listed, Nobody, nobody's giving me a list, but uh, I've been told that June Everett has got COVID, and of course, don't need to visit someone who's got COVID, so let's not do that, but keep her in our prayers. Uh, we do have a card from the ramp that we built, not this past Friday, but Friday before that. Uh, Betty Reyes, I think she's the, the lady who told us to go build that one, right? Yeah, that's, that's from a friend, of the, the one that we built for. De Dear Keith and Ramp Volunteers, thank you so much for building ramps for friends who need them so much. Leela Webb and Helen Stanley, you are truly the hands and feet of our Lord Jesus Christ, Betty Reyes. And then we got a contribution from the church that this lady visits in Mayfield, the First United Methodist Church of Mayfield, and a thank you from them as well. Anybody else that we need to mention on our sick list? David and... Okay. Anyone else? I got Johnny. Who? Zach Latham. Is this a friend of yours? Anyone else? Okay. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin our Bible class today. Oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, we are so, so thankful, Father, for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us. One that we can come together to join our hearts and minds and worship unto thee. We thank you so much for the blessings of life that you've given us to make our lives a little bit easier to live while we're here on this earth. Help us to always be mindful of where these blessings come from and give you the praise for it. We thank you for the blessings that we have in Christ, for being a member of your church, for him being our Savior and our Redeemer. We thank you so much for what he did for us and what he is doing. We pray, Father, your richest blessings on us as we also make sure that we thank you for these things on a daily basis. We pray now, Father, as we enter into our, our Bible class hour that those who are teaching us today will have a good remembrance of what is prepared for us and help us as students, Father, of your word to be ready to listen, ready to open our Bibles, and ready to make sure that what we hear is correct. We pray, Father, that you would be with the speakers of the, the Bible classes. Ask for that you would forgive us for our sins. For we know that uh, many times we fall short and we disappoint you, Father, and we sin, and we, we know this. And we come before confessing these things, Father. Help us to repent from these things. And we know, Father, that you will forgive us. And when we do, we ask for that you would always be with us, keep us safe, and love us, and finally, in the end, save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Glad you're able to be here and a part of our Sunday morning Bible class. As all of you know, we've been studying... The book of Acts, and I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2 as we consider the latter part of this chapter and think about this summary statement of these first days of the church and how it is described here, what they were like. 
how they related to each other and those who were without or outside of their faith community. How did they relate to them? And so this is a very helpful summary at the end of Acts chapter 2 that I think we will appreciate and be reminded of some very thoughtful things. If you have your Bibles open, let's read here the latter part of Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 42 through the end of the chapter. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, or awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as many as had need. And day by day, attending the temple together or gathering in the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So you can see as we read through those scriptures, we're having then some perspective given to us as to what then developed after the preaching of the gospel here on the day of Pentecost. Did the preaching have any effect? What was that effect in those early days? Well, this summarizes for us these matters. Now, when we think about the book of Acts coming right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we are seeing, as we have described, the promises of Jesus being fulfilled. Very specific promises to the apostles and his promise about the church. The very specific promises to the apostles had to do with them being empowered to be his witnesses. And we see this playing out on the day of Pentecost. They are not simply relying on their own intuition or recollection, but they have special guidance from the Holy Spirit enabling them to preach perfectly, and accurately about Jesus Christ. That involves the promise he made to them. And so, as we said back in John chapter 16, uh, 14, 15, and 16, Jesus made specific promises about the Holy Spirit being given to them to guide them into all the truth. We see that happening here. But we also see that Jesus promised, not just that they would be empowered, but Jesus foretold the fact that this is going to be successful. And we remind ourselves about this from two particular things. First of all, he said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, if it had all fallen flat and fell apart in Jerusalem, there would be no witnessing to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But that is what the book of Acts is about in documenting the promise of Jesus, how the preaching of the gospel is going to expand and people from all over are going to be learning about Jesus and accepting the gospel. But we remember this promise in particular as well. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It will succeed. And we just keep in mind, especially as we move into chapter 3 soon, that this success that we're talking about, 
by the apostles being empowered and by people receiving the gospel and learning they can be forgiven of their sins through Jesus Christ. This is not going to go smoothly for everyone involved. That there is going to be opposition to this. It's not like the the chief priests are going to roll out the red carpet for the apostles and they'll just have no opposition and preach the gospel all they want. That's not what's going to happen as we all know. They are going to be opposed and threatened. But Jesus said what? What was His promise? The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, death is going to be a tool to fight against my church, but it's not going to work. It will be successful in spite of the efforts against it. So this statement now at the end of Acts 2, we read this with an appreciation that Jesus said, in essence, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be successful. I'll empower them and the church will prevail. So here's how Luke then documents those early days when the church had been established and it began to grow and function. It describes a number of things about the church. And let's think about them as these verses specifically describe it for us. Look at verse 42 that we read just a second ago. This is describing these people. These people who were disciples of the Lord and these individuals who had obeyed the gospel. You remember right here in verse 41? So those who gladly received His word, were baptized. And there were added in that day about 3,000 souls. And they, these people who were baptized, they didn't just merely accept Jesus and go on about their business. They became a functioning and worshiping and loving and evangelistic community. They had something now in their being together that was different before they obeyed the gospel. And notice how verse 42 begins to tell us about what's happened. They continued steadfastly, or they devoted themselves to what? Here are the four things that we read. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching. Now, why would they do that? Why would they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching? What was so important about that? What do you think? Okay, good. They had to learn. And they had more to learn. Okay, the apostles were the very means by which they would get this instruction. Had Jesus said anything about this? Had He said anything about the apostles teaching people? In fact, remember this in Matthew chapter 28. Verse 19 and 20. Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them what? To observe all things. What things? That I commanded you. And so we see the apostles doing that, and we see how it is received. This group of individuals, now 3,000 plus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' 
teaching. Now something else is emphasized several times in this chapter, and right here at the end too, that the apostles were a group of men who, by the very way they're referred to, they are the apostles. The others are not apostles. They are the apostles, the 12 apostles. And their teaching is what guides the church. And so this is what Jesus told them to do, but the people are recognizing them as the apostles who give the teaching of Jesus. I remember on one occasion Jesus made this statement, Luke 10 and verse 16. Those who receive you, he's talking to the apostles. Those who receive you, receive me. Those who reject you, reject me. Those who receive you, receive me, and therefore receive him that sent me. And the people are understanding this, that the apostles are not giving their opinion and somebody else doesn't stand up and say, well, I don't really agree with Peter on that. Here's what I think about the prayers and here's what I think about the Lord's Supper. No, they continued in the apostles' doctrine because the apostles' doctrine was from Jesus Christ, from the Holy Spirit, from God. And it thus was the standard by which the church believed and functioned and practiced various things. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, I want to read another passage to you. If you want to turn there, that's fine. I'll read it to you. You can hold your place in Acts 2. But I want to read this passage from 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. And I will, I will note, and all of us, I think, no doubt remember this, that as Paul writes this letter, uh, he's an apostle, right? He was added later on and made an apostle by Jesus Christ. So he writes here in 1 Timothy 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So now he's a part of this group who are responsible directly from Christ for teaching the church. So he writes this in verse 3. Writing to Timothy, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus that you may charge certain persons not to teach a different doctrine. Now clearly Paul understands as an apostle of Jesus Christ that there is on the one hand teaching and on the other hand different teaching. And he said, Timothy, this is the very reason I asked you to stay in Ephesus. Why? To charge certain men not to teach a different doctrine. Now how is Timothy to know what doctrine is approved and what doctrine is to be resisted? How did he know that? Well, there was a standard. The apostles' doctrine. In other words, the church had teaching from the apostles and it was, being from the apostles, the standard by which everything should be judged or compared. And we might as well, while we're here, look in chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and see this emphasized again. If anyone teaches a different doctrine 
and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords to godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Now, a lot of folks today won't like what Paul says here, right? That sounds judgmental. You know why it sounds judgmental? Because it is. Because there's teaching that comes from Jesus through the apostles. And then there are things that are not. Jesus himself is warning us in Matthew 7 and verse 15 when he says, Beware of false teachers. Paul writes to the congregations in an area called Galatia. Remember that book that is named that, the letter to the Galatians. And he says in Galatians 1 and verse 6, I marvel that you are so quickly removing yourselves from him who called you in the grace of Christ unto a different gospel. And then he, he clarifies in verse 7. Not that there's another gospel, like another one, another legitimate one. Not that there's another gospel, only there are some that would pervert the gospel of Christ. And he says in chapter 3 of that book, in verse 1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who mesmerized you that you should so quickly depart from what you've been taught? And so he then addresses in the book of Galatians different doctrine. Twisted doctrine. And he is not addressing uh, atheism. He is not addressing Hinduism or Buddhism or some other ism. He's addressing a twisted form of Christianity. A disturbed teaching about Christ. And so that's why he says in Galatians 5 and verse 4, you folks who, who are teaching this or, or are buying into this, you who would be justified, you who, who think that you can be saved by the law, talking about the law of Moses, you're severed from Christ, you're falling away from grace. So we, we can see as we go through the New Testament, that there were problems in different places, whether it's Galatia or Timothy being left in Ephesus or wherever. There were problems with some introducing things that were not the apostles' doctrine. Now, we're probably not surprised that if that was done right in the very presence of the apostles, we're not surprised that it goes on today. But today, we still should follow the apostles' teaching. That's what the early church did from the beginning, and yet there were those who departed from it. One more passage that I'll introduced in this regard comes from Colossians chapter 2. And we probably find it very interesting that the church in this town that was called Colossae receives this letter from Paul. And when you read through this letter, you learn the fact that Paul did not 
go to this city, preach the gospel, and convert the first people in this town. You know, that's what happened in the city of Philippi. He wrote a letter to the, Philipp to the Philippians. Well, he had preached the gospel for the very first time in that town. He was the first one there. Same way in Corinth. He was the first one in that town. Wrote a letter to him later. Well, he was not the first person to preach the gospel in Colossae. And when you read the letter, he mentions the fact that he was writing to people who had never met him. So you might wonder, how would they take this? They don't know Paul. He's not the one who preached the gospel to them. They might say something like people do. Well, who does he think he is? He's never even been here. He doesn't know us. What's he writing a letter like this? Because this letter deals with some doctrinal problems and Paul is writing to correct these problems well who is he he's an apostle of Jesus Christ and that's why we're reading in Acts chapter 2 of this prominent statement at the very beginning of the summary about the church you know what defined them they were people who were devoted to the apostles doctrine that's what made them distinct because the apostles' doctrine was from Jesus Christ. And here's the passage from Colossians that I think is very important. Colossians 2 and verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. As you received Christ, you know, what you were taught about Jesus and what you were taught... To follow Jesus just like you were taught. So walk in Him. And so he goes on to say in verse 8, See that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elements, elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. See that warning? There's going to be different things. People are going to introduce different ideas and philosophies and teachings. Don't let anyone spoil you or take you captive by a different doctrine. So this is a theme throughout the rest of the New Testament. The early church devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, but there would be influences there would be people just like Jesus warned about wolves in sheep's clothing there would be this element that we have to be aware of but the apostles were devoting them I'm sorry the people were devoting themselves to the apostles teaching secondly it says in verse 42 and fellowship and then the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is what defined them now that they are followers of Jesus Christ. The word fellowship is a word that is used both in a broad sense and in a narrow sense in the New Testament. But the basic idea is sharing. If you have fellowship, you share something. And it's used in very specific ways, like sharing your blessings. You see that here, right? As this describes their sharing, they, they shared meals together. They shared their resources to help particular ones that had need. In 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, when Paul talks about the church collecting their funds together, he describes that as a fellowship, as a sharing. So the basic idea is fellowship. We have something in common, we're sharing in something, whether that's collecting for our giving or sharing in one another's lives, being together. And so... In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about 
withdrawing fellowship from someone who's impenitent and living in sin. So there's no more sharing. But here we have described this unique characteristic of the church. Now they're sharing in many different ways. It also says that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. There was something very specific that Jesus said his followers would do. You think about Luke writing about this and then right at the end of his gospel and then we turn the page and start reading about the fulfillment of Jesus' plan. What had Jesus just said? We might put it like this. Literally weeks before, what had he said? Well, this is what my followers will do. They'll take the bread, they'll take the fruit of the vine, and they will do this in memory of me. And of course, then he was crucified, raised from the dead, and spent those 40 days with the apostles and other disciples, and then ascended. Now the day of Pentecost comes, and now they start observing the Lord's Supper. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the sharing together, in the breaking of bread and the prayers. And think about the following statements. The effect of this that is summarized in verse 42. This unity that was created. This community that was founded in the name of Jesus Christ. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to these various activities of sharing and worship and prayers. What effect did this have on others? And that's the point following. Fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And... All who believed were together and had all things common. Now there are a couple of footnotes that we could add just by way of observation that I think is helpful and it reminds us of the value of reading all the verses. And this is what I mean by that. You look at verse 44 and how are these people described? All who believed. Now, if I were to approach that, that verse like some of my friends do, they just say, look, they believed. That's what they did. That doesn't say anything about them being baptized. It says they, they believed. And, and I would say to my friend, what? Well, hold on a minute. This one verse is describing something very important about these people. They're believers. But if I back up and just read all the verses, what do I learn? Verse 41, they gladly received his word and were baptized. So I don't want to just read this one verse and harp on one word. That wouldn't be helpful. But if I read all the verses, I see that these believers are people who had received Peter's word. And Peter's word was this, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. So, so I put all that together and I learned what a believer really is. It's not someone who's merely giving assent to some facts about Jesus but a believer is someone who's gladly received the apostles' words and, and responded to them and done what they said. So that's, a, that's just an example of the need to read all the verses and not be fixated on one word and draw from it what is clearly inappropriate. But here's the point. 
They were all together and they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were sharing in so many ways, observing the Lord's Supper, and involved in all kinds of prayers. The prayers, plural. Whether prayers of thanksgiving or praise or petitions. There were all kinds of prayers, public and private. They were devoted to acknowledging God together, praying. This had an effect on other people and the apostles were doing miracles and those who believed were together. They were together and had all things in common. Now an example of that is in verse 45. What's going on here? Well, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all. And notice this qualifying phrase. As any had need. And what we have here is not the fact that the apostles in following the Lord's direction and preaching the gospel, they did not establish some kind of Christian community where then all differences economically were erased. Everybody sold their goods and then they gave everybody an equal amount. Sometimes people appeal to passages like this to, to suggest something of that kind. But when we look at this, we see, number one, it was voluntary. And number two, the distributions were made according to what? Someone's need. So it wasn't a redistribution to make everyone absolutely equal. And here we can add in, just so we, we recognize what's being said as opposed to what is not being said, that we come to the end of Acts chapter 4. And we have another description of how generous people were, how thoughtful that's the point. And the Bible says in Acts 4 verse 32, this is another one of these kind of sum, uh, summations of what was going on. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Here's an example. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, question. This is what was being done at the very beginning, Acts chapter 2. People were helping those who had needs. Is it the case that the apostles learned that, well, Barnabas has a field, called him in, said, Barnabas, we need to have a meeting. It's our understanding that you're holding on to something. You know, for the past several months, people have been helping others who have needs, and we've found out that you have a piece of property you have not liquidated. We need you to do that and bring that and give us the proceeds from that. Is that what was done? Or did he not do this voluntarily? Now, what's important is what we read next in order to answer that question if there's any doubt. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Uh-oh. 
What's the problem with that? Well, had the apostles said, everyone who owns property needs to sell it and you need to bring it all to us. Is that what was going on? No, that's not what was going on. People were doing this voluntarily and making personal decisions about what to contribute. How do we know that? Well, this is what happens. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? What was the problem here? That he decided to retain some of the funds and give part of the funds? Was that the problem? No. The problem was he lied. And let Peter explain. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? See, there was no compulsion. It was yours to do what you want with. And after it was sold... Was it not yours to do what you wanted to do? So the problem was not how he divided the funds. The problem was they lied and said, this is from the sale of our property and it's every dime. That was the problem. Now I just point that out because it is... An additional description of the kind of thing that's going on in Acts chapter 2. We appreciate they are, they are not being individually instructed what to do with their personal property. They are not being compelled. Nor are all the funds being redistributed so everyone's equal. Some owned property, some did not. Sometime after what we read in Acts, Barnabas still owns a piece of property. Other Christians own property, and Peter says, it's yours to do what you want with. Now that aside, because of those things that are drawn from this text that are inappropriate, people that appeal to this passage for those reasons, let's focus on what is being described. It's not the redistribution of their resources, but what? Voluntary, generous concern. Where there are people who have needs and they're being helped. And I just wonder if some of these needs are from the fact that, again, who are these 3,000 people? Well, we don't know exactly, individually, But it does appear the fact that here we have on the day of Pentecost people who had come to Jerusalem. What is the day of Pentecost? Well, that was one of their holidays. And so you had people come from all over, and Peter describes where they're coming from, all over the place. And and of course, they don't know when they, they make this plan to travel to Jerusalem. They don't know that Peter and the apostles are going to get up and preach the gospel. They don't know that they're going to learn the gospel and then become Christians and then may want to extend their stay. They don't, they don't plan that. And there may be people that want to stay and learn more from the apostles' teaching before they go home. And they're maybe in a position where, well, we didn't prepare for this. We're not prepared. It's not like you have an ATM card, right, where you just go withdraw some cash. They may be much more difficult to plan for an extended stay and have the funds available. So they may be staying with family or friends. So we could envision a number of reasons why needs developed very quickly For a lot of people. Whatever the cause was. The point is. From the very beginning. The church was a loving church. The church 
was a learning church. The church was a worshiping church. And the church was an evangelistic church. The Bible says, as we continue to read here, that they were together daily in the temple because that was like a community center for them. A very big courtyard to gather in was available to them. They were eating together. We don't suppose that all 3,000 people were invited over somebody's house, do you? Come on over, we're having a potluck. I mean, imagine that line. You know Tommy would get in ahead of that line, 3,000 people at a potluck. In all seriousness, what we find are these people are together and, and they're all over town, all over the countryside, and they're getting together. And they're coming together in the temple, which could accommodate large crowds, and they're, they're receiving teaching, and they're going home, and they're having meals together. You see that something is happening. They're Christians. And they find out that somebody's having a hard time. They want to help. They find out that, hey, tomorrow morning we're having a Bible study with Andrew, one of the apostles in the temple. We're going to go. It's Sunday. It's the first day of the week. We're going to get together and have the Lord's Supper. We're going to hear a lesson from the apostles. They were worshiping, they were loving, and they were learning from the very beginning. And this resulted in the fact, and this is a very significant statement, that while they were together and eating together and receiving their food with gladness and generous hearts, they were praising God, and notice in verse 41, and having favor with all the people. This indicates the impact that this, from the very beginning, was having on other people. See, other people were going to the temple too. Other people were in the city too. And they were observing something is happening. with the preaching of the gospel, with the formation of the church or this community in the name of Jesus, and they see how caring and loving and devoted they are from the very beginning, and this resulted in people being favorably disposed to them. They were not threatening anyone. They were having a good influence from the very beginning. And what was the result? We would add this in the latter part of verse 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so from that beginning, the church grew. More people were being saved. And again, if I want to know what it means to be saved and to be added by the Lord to the church, all I have to do is read the verses that lead up to this to learn that. But they were an evangelistic group from the very beginning and having a good influence in their community. So we have the first description of the church in these verses. What have we observed they were a learning church following the apostles' doctrine. A loving church concerned for each other. A worshiping church and an evangelistic church. And that's exactly what the Lord wants us to be too. Just like they were from the very beginning. Well, we'll look forward to moving ahead and continuing our study in the book of Acts. Thank you so much for being here.